wind is air in motion. No one has ever held air or wind in his heart. But you can only feel the effects of the wind, either through a wild wind or a hurricane. And he whosoever doesn't take cover will never notice the killer punch of a hurricane or a wild wind. And so too is the definition of malice. It was the submission by my learned senior, Mr. Kureshi, as well as my colleague, Mr. Bitter, that the petitioner has not particularized the plea of malice, neither has she given evidence of malice. My ladies and my lords, how do you explain a scenario where investigations are alleged to have commenced on the 21st of May 2018? An order is made on the 22nd of June 2018 in respect of Blue Nile accounts held at KCB. Yes, a lot uh, a complaint is alleged to have been made on the 21st of May 2018. An order is made on the 22nd of June 2018 directed at Blue Nile in respect of its account with KCB. That order is taken to the receiver manager of Imperial Bank. The receiver manager, Mahmoud Mohamed, <coughs> claims to have sought legal advice, and as a result thereof, released the banking records of the petitioner for scrutiny. How can you explain the testimony of four bank officials, Kivindio, Shamji, Katere, and Mahmoud, all stating that we will follow this commercial transaction, we will follow the undertaking, but we can't do that because the DCI has taken the file. Ladies and my lords, by the 24th of August 2018, the file had been combined by the DCI and forwarded to the DPP for prosecution. <coughs> the monitor lizard has a uh, limited uh, hearing ability. So it must be very fast to respond to the wind. From nowhere, the DPP ambulates into action and says, oh, before I prosecute, have you taken the statements of Philomena Beta Willu? Have you taken the statement of Stanley Monovi Kiema? Now, they do last that which they ought to have done first. Twenty seventh of August, twenty eighteen. It's a Monday. The petitioner wakes her up to a headline that she will be arrested. Well, the DPP does not publish the Daily Nation. The events of the 28th of August, 2018, will always remain in the memory of the petitioner. 
as the day when her persecution almost happened. I say so because I have the greatest conviction that on the basis of the evidence of the law, that persecution will be stopped by this court. This is what happened on the 28th of August, 2018. At 12.30 p.m. at the Supreme Court buildings, the statement of the petitioner is taken by Abdallah Komesha in the presence of the DCI and the DPP. At 1.30 p.m., the petitioner is arrested in the Supreme Court building and taken to the DCI headquarters at Mazingara House. At 2.30 p.m. Excuse me, my God. I'm very sorry to interrupt. It was said very well that when the statement of the petitioner was taken, it was herself the investigator and her advocate. Where would it say that the DPP was present? And he has to take uh, the, the, there, are, there are four Gospels. The most credible one is the Gospel according to Luke because he was a medical doctor. So that is their version, according to John. This is our version according to Luke. It's verified. Now, <laughs> at the, the senior council was there. And uh, about four of us were in the advocate's lobby following the proceedings on Philip. So at 2.30 PM, the DPP releases a press statement. And that statement was referred to at length by my learned senior, Mr. Qureshi. And you see, in the statement, under item number five at page 86, the DPP made a pronouncement that determined, in his view, the guilt of the petitioner. He said, there can be no justice if lawyers, prosecutors, magistrates, judges, and investigators who are court officials use their position to enrich themselves at the expense of the Kenyan people. Enrich themselves. He was talking about the petitioner. Nobody else. He proceeds to state, Lady Justice Mwilu abused her office for personal gain, accepted a gift in the form of money in circumstances which undermine public confidence in integrity of her office, conducted herself in disregard of the law. At 4.30 4, 4 p.m., no, sorry, at 3.30 p.m., at the DCI, when this statement is being read, she's still being interrogated at uh, Mazingara House. Then she's formally charged. She's brought to court 10 minutes before 5. And the magistrate then, just as Pontius Pilate did about 2,000 years ago, said, why have you brought her at this hour? <laughs> Could you have brought her at a time within which I would have been able to consider a request for bail for it to be processed? I will release her. Now, these are the devastating effects of a hurricane or a wild wind. You will not see it, you will not catch it, but you will see. That is malice. One decision which we relied upon, but which, with your permission, I should just read. In the case of uh, Republic versus Director of Public Prosecution, Experte Praxidis Namosi. Praxidis Namosi is one of us. 
She's an advocate. She was also a magistrate at one point in time. I made my maiden appearance as an advocate before her on the 17th of June 2003. So I remember her very well. You will find the relevant extract at page 199 of our initial bundle. Page 199. It's, it's important that we look at it. Page 199, page 10 of the bottom. And this is what Justice Odunga said at paragraph 78, second line. Malice, however, can either be expressed or can be gathered from the circumstances surrounding the prosecution. Then further down, he says, in other words, the police or any other prosecution arm of the government is not a mere conduit of complaints. And then he concludes in that, in that paragraph, neglect to make a reasonable use of the sources of information available before instituted proceedings may therefore be evidence of malice and hence abuse of discretionary power. We've been told, go and make that lamentation before the trial court. Why should we go there? A trial is not a roller coaster, however fast it is. And Justice Richard Glover underscored this fundamental tenet of fair trial when he made the decision appearing as number nine in our initial list, the case of Vincent Kibiego Maina versus the Attorney General. But because of the eloquence of the manner of his writing, permit me just to read. You'll we'll find this at page 144 of the initial bundle. And this is what Richard Glover said. Every litigant, in fact, it's titled Square Mill Guaranteed. Square Mill. Every litigant has a stake in fairness. It must be seen in every institution, every public functionary, in everyone, individually or collectively. It must be manifested at every stage. In the context of the instant application, as always, the police must provide and be seen to provide fairness to all persons. So fairness that we're talking about is the one that preceded the arraignment of the 29th of August, 29th of August, 2018. The second issue that I'll deal with was dealt upon at length by my learned senior, Mr. Qureshi. And he said this, Imperial Bank lost close to 34 billion shillings. <coughs> close, close to 34 billion Kenya shillings. We've indicated these 34 billion Kenya shillings in the subject matter of HCC number 522 of 2015. If at all, the petitioner was one of those people who occasioned this loss, why is she not in that case as a defendant? We've been told, HCC number 522 of 2015, you'll find this uh, case at uh, at page uh, forty two of the exhibit of the supplementary <coughs> affidavit. The case is there.
The concern espoused by my landed senior was this. The dealings between the petitioner and the bank were not at arm's length. There was nobody who was bold enough to make the complaint against the judge because of fear of appraisal. At the tail end of my discourse, I will take you to the story of Kerubo Nancy Barasa, and we'll want to evaluate between the four bank officials and Nancy Kerubo, who was in a weaker position to make a complaint. But suffice it to say, and this is paramount, the action of the DPP and the DCI contravenes Article 27 of the Constitution. <coughs> that is Article 27, sub Article 1. Therein lies a fundamental protection from discrimination. And it's expressed thus, every person is equal before the law and has the right of equal protection and equal benefit of the law. That is what we are saying. Figure out this. And uh, many of uh, my ladies at my lordship have experienced this before the trial court. A commercial dispute goes before the magistrate, and then at the tail end of the testimony of the complainant, he or she is asked, Unataka koti kufanyia nini? Unataka koti derudishia pisayangu. Ideally, the complaint, if any, from the bank is a complaint for money. How will that complaint be remedied in the intended criminal prosecution? It can't. It is not there. Ladies and my lords, both Mr. Qureshi and Mr. Bitter submitted at length by indicating that the function of criminal prosecution is one reserved for the DPP and that the DPP cannot await a decision of the JSC because in doing so, he will be acting under the direction or control of a third party, contrary to Article 157. <coughs> but that was not any of our plea. In fact, our plea was the contrary. The petitioner's complaint was there is no legal and factual foundation for this criminal charge. And if that be the case, as it is, I submit, then the attempt to arraign me before a criminal trial is intended to amount to my constructive removal from office. The petitioner's plea was that first there is no criminal case. Just prior to that, she said something about an argument has been raised by the EPP that the petitioner should not have the EPP should not await an outcome by the EPP. Yes, yes. That was not the position taken by the petitioner. We, we have not said that wait for a decision from the JSC. In fact, we have said there is no criminal case against her. And that this is a roundabout way of constructively removing her from office through arraignment before a criminal court. dealt with this issue when he considered the article by 
gold. I will spend some little time on this article, which uh, which your lordship and my ladyship will find at page 299 all the way to page 323. of uh, the initial list and bundle of authorities filed by the petition. This is a list dated the 13th of September 2018. It's filed in court on the 14th of September. My lords, we'll start uh, this discourse with uh, page three or six. Page three or six, under temporary immunity from criminal prosecution. Page three, zero six. Page dated at the bottom. posits as follows. He says, similarly, public policy suggests that temporary criminal immunity for a sitting judge outweighs the detriment to the society that the immunity creates because the immunity facilitates an independent and biased judiciary in the same fashion as does civil judicial immunity. It is a public policy consideration. Under Article 10 of the Constitution, public policy is underscored in the making of decisions. And then uh, at page 314, gold espouses a, a policy founded upon American jurisprudence at page 314. It is called impeachment before arraignment. <coughs> impeachment before arraignment. And he suggests that impeachment before arraignment is proper because a criminal prosecution, that is under item two, is tantamount to removal regardless of whether it results in an acquittal or a conviction. That is the, the American context. In India, the context is captured in the decision appearing at uh, item number 19, the case of Vera Swami. And the reason why in India it is proper to remove the immunity of the judge before prosecuting him or her is set out at page 338. That is under item 7.1. And it goes thus. The purpose of grant of previous sanction before prosecution, prosecuting a public servant, including a judge of the High Court, of the Supreme Court is to protect the judge from unnecessary harassment and frivolous prosecution, more particularly to save the judge from the biased prosecution for giving judgment in a case which goes against the government or its officers. Frivolous prosecution cannot be launched against a judge for giving a judgment against the central government. At page 409, all the way to page 4010 of the same decision, that principle is further espoused. Nigeria is the case which appears as item number 20, Ngajiwa versus the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In that case, a judge of the Supreme Court faced a complaint 
of, amongst others, unlawful acquisition of property. The Nigerian Judicial Commission had the same power as does, uh, as does our Judicial Service Commission to discipline judicial officers and to entertain complaints towards the removal of judges. Now, when the judge was arraigned before the court, his objection that the complaint of misconduct was one for the Nigerian Judicial Service Commission was dismissed. The matter went all the way to the Supreme Court, which at page 465 determined the issue. At page 465. And this is what the Supreme Court said, 65 immediately after paragraph D. The question one then asks is whether due process was followed in the case. Absolutely not. The respondent without first complaining to the Nigerian Judicial Service Commission, Nigerian Judicial Commission, the body primarily responsible for the discipline of judicial officers who breached their oath of office, proceeded to court instituting criminal proceedings against the appellant. It is a breach of due process that the respondent will avoid the Nigerian Judicial Commission in the prosecution of acts which primarily borders on misconduct of a judicial nature. Misconduct of a judicial officer. Yes, ma'am. It was a 2017 decision, this one. So it's very recent, and uh, the comparative approach between Kenya and Nigeria is quite close. And in fact, we borrowed a lot from Nigeria uh, in matters of this kind. And then uh, what is even of great significance, the power donated to the Nigerian Judicial Commission under the Constitution of Nigeria is the same power that appears for the Judicial Service Commission here. Under 171C. Yes, and my ladies, you will find this at 172, sub article 1C where the Judicial Service Commission is the body tasked with receiving and investigating complaints. So that, uh, my lady, permit me to con conclude uh, my submissions on that particular area with reference to the story of Kerubo and uh, Nancy Baraza. And this is very important because it allays the concern raised by my learned uh, senior that the caliber of the judge will not permit a complaint to be made towards the recovery of the alleged monies. You will find uh, the determination commencing at page 483. But what is of relevance to this issue is at page 490, the framing of the charges against the judge. If you look at the statement of gross misconduct and misdemeanor, the judge was accused of threatening to shoot Rebecca Kerubo with a pistol. 
the equivalent of that in the penal code will be attempted murder. At page 491, under item 1 on the first version, a complaint was made to the DCI. The court will have an opportunity of interrogating uh, this matter further. But it goes to demonstrate that there are instances where if the complaint against a judge is one of uh, misconduct, then there is the duality of regimes. And the first port of call is the Judicial Service Commission. Now, under the Code of Conduct, item uh, 6, it, it's exhibited <coughs> to our supplementary list in bundle of authorities, the Judicial Code of Conduct and Ethics. Item 6 deals with integrity, and uh, subparagraph 4 and 5 deal with the issue of improper enrichment using <coughs> the office. <coughs> Item 5 deals with loans and gifts. Now, if you move to the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act under Section 40, you will find the offense of abuse of office. It is alleged that the use of the letterhead on the 15th of August 2013 was abuse of office, then that abuse of office is an integrity <coughs> issue. Why do we say so? Because it is claimed to be manifest in the use of the judiciary letterhead. Who is better placed to give credence to the propriety or otherwise of that charge than the employer. But we're not saying that by doing so, you cede to the JSC the power of criminal prosecution. No. You do so so that you strip the judge of immunity so that when the judge goes before the trial court, he doesn't go there as my lord or my lady. Imagine the chief magistrate calling the accused person, my, my, my lady, what do you say? That is the embarrassment that this disciplinary mechanism was intended to remedy. No wonder, therefore, a conviction for a criminal offense does not appear anywhere in the Constitution or in the statutes as a ground for removal of a judge. Because it is not, sorry, my lord. Just go over that again, just be angry. It's just a little slow. Oh, sorry, my lord. Sorry about that. So, that, my lord, uh, this mechanism under JSC is not intended to take over the prosecutorial power of the DPP. In fact, it is intended to enable those powers. First, strip the judge of her office of my lord or my lady so that she does or he does not appear as an accused person with the trappings and the protection of office. So it follows, therefore, that the attempt to pursue a complaint which, in our opinion and submission, does not lie in the beginning through the criminal process will amount to the constructive removal 
of the petitioner of office. <coughs> And we have seen our predecessor, though facing a criminal complaint of attempted murder, was first stripped of her title, and thereafter it was left to the DPP to make up his mind on whether or not to prosecute her. And that necessity is a necessity of public interest. In conclusion, refer, uh, my, my lady said, my lord, say, allow me to refer you to the Judicial Service Commission Act, that part that deals with the display of uh, judicial officers. It is comparative because this one relates to magistrates. So that in the disciplining of magistrates under the third schedule, item number 18, and uh, this is what it says, where a preliminary investigation or disciplinary inquiry, item 18, of, uh, of the Judicial Service Commission uh, rules on the discipline of magistrates, where a preliminary investigation or disciplinary inquiry discloses a criminal offense, may have been committed by an officer, the Chief Justice shall act under either paragraph 26 or 27. So the Chief Justice will leave the magistrate of his or her office, so that the magistrate can go and face criminal prosecution. My ladies and my lords, I humbly beseech you to allow this petition. I'll leave the remaining minutes to my senior, Dr. Hamilton.